horsepower blower you spoke of? I didn't speak of a six horsepower blower for Synergy. That's from uh, Bo Schmidt's work. Uh, with respect to uh, the, our boundary layer control system, the uh, placement of the holes is behind the maximum thickness. So we're using the maximum thickness and the natural laminar flow of the body as an inertial separator. So the airflow coming over the top takes any dirt or foreign matter or water or ice and tends to separate it away from the actual surface so we don't ingest nearly as much of the uh, the stuff that complicates down the air control by using it in the aft section. Yes? There is no, that, there's no air that's blown through those holes. Is it the natural flow process? The question is, there's no air that's blown through the holes. It's just a natural process. No, I don't believe that blowing is the way to control the boundary layer. It can be done, but the blowing was chosen as a method because we have bleed air from a compressor on a jet engine. What we really want aerodynamically is suction. We want to take the stagnant air and remove it, re-energize it, and spit it back out. So what we do with our control air is we take it from the aft section of the wing, we run it into the engine compartment, okay? it's run by it through the blower and over all the cooling components. Your oil cooler, your air cooler, your intercooler, your exhaust, your turbocharger. And by the time it's done that and it's in the contracting volume and exits the vertical slot underneath the prop, it's an exhaust augmenting heated airstream and delivers significant cooling thrust. Yes, angular connections of the airfoil, and the question is interference drain. Um, that is really misleading to people, and I mentioned it earlier in connection with pipeline interference. What causes a uh, what causes an interference condition at an intersection has nothing to do with the intersection. There's nothing that the air says, oh, I can't handle a 90 degree corner that's, if I look at it from straight on, if it's a 90 degree corner, I can't handle that. What causes the interference is what's happening to the air over here, what's happening to the air over here, what's happening to the air over here. And if we have a big fight happening across the surface, then we'll get interference there. So what this, this is version 18, and the lens has changed completely. But when you look at it in 3D, you find out that there's a big stagger. Here's our quarter cord line. Here's our quarter cord line. And so there's actually a lot of three-dimensional transition happening here. But what prevents uh, a significant interference drag is the fact that this is a pressure surface, this is a pressure surface, and this is a pressure surface. I'm sorry, I did that wrong. The outside of the surfaces are all pressure surfaces. The inside surfaces are all suction surfaces. And so they're not having an argument across a surface about what the air is supposed to be doing. Now, when you get to the center section of the wing, the wing to fuselage junction is always a problematic uh, place for interference drag to occur. And it's hard to deal with. It was hard to deal with even on Synergy. And we, on Synergy, we have it easy. The reason we have it easy is I don't have a big bump in my displacement volume on that graph where my wing starts. It comes to the wing. And as our sectional volume increases, it goes outward. So we actually are starting to pressurize the air out here about the time we're starting to need it to go back in here. That means that pressurized air out here is seeing suction air there, and we're causing the airflow to go back where it was before. Right? There's a lot of complicated stuff to that, but uh, that's the simplest explanation I can give you about why we don't have any don't have the real significant interference drag issues to be concerned about on this energy. Are the passengers and fuel pretty much on the center of gravity? And how does that handle center of gravity shifts? The question is, are the passengers and fuel on the center of gravity, and how do we handle our center of gravity shifts? Uh, boy, that was one thing I didn't think, uh, I didn't plan for it. I wish I could claim credit for it, but it just worked out beautifully. Solo, you're flying a lightweight ship and you're as far forward as possible. So you've got a fairly, that's actually your most rearward CG uh, configuration you normally get. 
and it makes for a super awesome handling. Uh, you know, obviously I haven't flown except in my mind and in the simulator, so to say that it's not proven. But as you add weight, you need the center of gravity to move forward on synergy. Because we want to maintain the same proportion of downloading on the elevons uh, with gross weight increase. So as the plane gets heavier, we want to push down a little more with our tail. And it turns out that there's no way you can load synergy that doesn't do that and keep the center, keep the CG just dead on. It actually has a more than a one foot range of CG, but you can't make it move that much. Yes? I'd like to hear a little bit about how long you've been working on this project and the history. Just a little more on the history and how long we've been working on it. Well, uh, I think I've been working on this since 1977. I just didn't know it. Yeah, I, 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 yeah, I don't know how to describe that history except to say that it's in, always, always, always been on my mind how to get uh, laminar flow, how to get weight propulsion right, how to get uh, boundary layer control that works how to get long wingspan performance in a short wingspan package, how to make it not ugly. Uh, I don't know, it just, it, it suddenly came all together. In one day, I was, uh, I was at the computer and I had just finished reading some paper and suddenly Eureka, you know, one of these moments, I came running out of the room screaming at the top of my lungs to my wife, holy cow, you're not gonna believe this. So that's about all I can tell you about that. Now, since that moment, when I lost my mind, uh, I spent uh, thousands of hours researching to find out how close anyone had ever come to doing it this way. And I found out we've been really, really close many, many times. But even the people who advocated for those ideas and technologies didn't quite connect the dots, and they actually didn't necessarily believe what they were seeing. John, how do you expect icing to impact the design? How do I expect icing to be uh, addressed or impacting the design? Um, you know, icing is a, a significant issue for a certified airplane. I'm not really too concerned about it, but I've thought about it a lot. And I've designed ways that the structure uh, is favorable to the routing of um, heated fluids, to using electrical de ice. I think good natural laminar flow airplanes are inherently less ice susceptible than others. Our primary ice susceptibility has to do with our control surfaces and whether or not our tails are, are affected. This is a big problem. Uh, and so at the level that we're at right now, we've studied it on a preliminary basis, a conceptual basis. And I don't see any big red flags coming, but I'll be trying to work with people who are more expert in that field. One thing I will not be doing is putting anything on there like boots that would destroy laminar flow. Okay. Will the full size model have flaps and what is our tail volume coefficients like? <clears throat> yes, the full size model has a slip flap from boom tube to boom tube. It's eight and a half feet long. It's there mostly as an air brake, so we have some way of adding to drag, but it does significantly increase our maximum lift coefficient. In order to demonstrate the cafe minimum flat, um, 2.3 maximum lift coefficient must be achieved, which we can achieve through a combination of flat and suction. As respects the tail volume coefficients, even though this looks like a short couple, we've got uh, about 24 feet of horizontal tail <laughs> in terms of its width and uh, 44 feet of area squared. Uh, so our tail volume coefficient is normal for an elevon equipped airplane. Not, not Elvon, I meant uh, El Oh my goodness. Full flag tail, what, what do we call it? Empanage. There we go. Alright, and the same thing for the vertical tail volume coefficients. We have winglets and vertical tails. Um, in fact, we have four of them that are high, high aspect ratio and that they're actually already positively loaded. Uh, those factors dramatically increase the stability in both the horizontal and vertical planes. So don't let the short coupling fool you, it's solid and raw.
Yes, we're talking about. Yeah, we have a lot of uh, we have a lot of drag because we have a lot of area because we have a high down force. Is that what you're saying? Yes. Yes. High down force equals high wind rate. Yes, absolutely true. Except that we're not putting it where we normally do. If I have a if I have a conventional tail, and this is my up here, it's nice when it's back a ways. I can make it smaller, and I can minimize the area, and I can minimize the downforce. That's the normal way to uh, reduce the drag. But if I put a wing, not a wing, if I put a tail above and behind a wing tip in this location, now I want, I want to throw as much air this way as I can hard as I can. There's an optimum. In the scientific literature, about 8% downforce delivers the optimum span efficiency for a continued wing configuration, like a C-wing or a box wing. Okay? So if I've got an 8% download based on my gross weight, that mandates that I move it very far forward or I have to uh, I have a the plane that wants to do loops. So by moving it forward like this and delivering about 8% of gross weight in downforce, we're loading the tails a lot more than you normally would, and you'd think that that would be drag. But it's not. It's drag reduction. It's the same thing as having more wingspan and having better L over D. You added 20 feet of wingspan, but your L over D went to the moon. How did you do that? By adding wetted area next to the additional wing area. It's simple. You reduce the big penalty of a new track. So a lot of counterintuitive stuff about that. I mean, one, uh, one thing I forgot to mention in conjunction with this uh, aspect of the double box tail is that because of it being short coupled, we have extreme control authority. But we have extreme control authority without a lot of travel. Okay? I was watching the videos in close-up and close-up telephoto views, and this is my this is my control travels when we're flying that quarter scale model. Okay, that's the amount of control travel. And at first we had too much control travel. That was one of the reasons people criticized the landing was on the video, but the guy was holding it all together and it was just totally over control ahead. And I was telling him to land with a military style roll out and everything else and. Um, the, the airplane doesn't need that much control authority. And the consequence of that and another aspect is that we don't see the continuing, we don't see the, uh, the likelihood of any stall spin behavior whatsoever with this plane. I built quite a few models that can either stall or spin. And if that maintains its way into the full scale article, I think we've really got something. What I see in the simulator is bobbing my hand. Why is this way I'm sorry. I missed that. What was your reason for shifting away from electric propulsion at this time? What was my reason for shifting away from electric propulsion at this time? I have a lot of intense work to do to make my full scale electric motor concept uh, work. And I was either going to have to immerse myself in that or immerse myself in the I thought the airframe was going to be easy and the motor was going to be hard. It looks like it's the other way around. It's on my mind all the time. I mentioned that amphibian. I think that uh, the appeal of slow and slow flight is strong for a lot of people. And it's very strong where we live. We have uh, high mountain alpine lakes all around us. And uh, you know, nothing would be cooler than for us to just take off and fly up to a lake, land and fly fish for a while and come back home. I think, I think that's the coolest thing in the world. So I'm, I'm very motivated to get to the point where we have other iterations of effective, efficient, quiet, amphibian capable flight. Yes, back there. <laughs> 